much, Nathan, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Jack. Uh, I'm a PhD student at SOAS, and my work focuses on historical fiction in Hindi and Urdu, but I'll be talking today a bit about the multilinguals project that I'm a part of at SOAS. I want to start off today by briefly um, outlining some of the details of the project, as the main issue I want to discuss today is more of a conceptual one than an explicitly practical one. I think the presentations of the last few days have been a very particular type of humanities, and I think it's to some extent the work that we do in, in our project has some correlation with some of the stuff we've talked about, but there are also some other issues in terms of it being um, a particular type of literary work that we're looking at. So I'm going to take some time to look at the details of the project a bit and then talk about some other stuff from there. So I'll talk a bit about the details, then explore some of the difficulties we've had in both identifying and managing our research data, and then I'll talk a little bit about how we've tried to um, mitigate some of those problems or some of those challenges that we've had going forward. Um, I would also preface this by saying that, unlike a lot of the projects we've talked about the last few days, we, on the project, haven't really engaged data management in a kind of structured or fully detailed way up to this point. This is something that for us, for whatever reason, has been quite a new thing. So this is a lot of um, kind of initial comments from me. So I'd really, really welcome any kind of comments or suggestions that you have as people who have more experience of this than, than I do at the end of the presentation. So multilingual local significant geographies come on, is a European Commission Horizon 2020 scheme, which is often abbreviated to Molossogy with the um, acronym there. We haven't standardised the way to say that word, so say it however you like and haven't decided yet. Um, the project brings into question the status of world literature as a discipline and the dominance of hegemonic languages within it, such as French, English, and uh, Spanish and German, by highlighting the multilingualism of and the many factors that contribute to regional and transnational literary fields. And I've been quoting here from the project description that we have on our website, and I've popped the URL just there as well, so you can see it for yourself. In practice, the project revolves around three sites. North India, North Africa, and the Horn of Africa that we're analysing both individually and under a comparative focus. Um, and this emphasis on comparison is important as, to our knowledge, there's been no direct link between North India, Morocco, and Ethiopia in modern times. This will be a project about contact, not about contact zones or connections, but rather about patterns and comparison. Um, so unlike certain other methodologies within comparative literature, for example, which privilege comparison between a, um, a centre in the global north and a kind of periphery in the global south. This is a project that really focuses on kind of south-south or south-south-south comparison as its main um, methodology between regions that we feel have been previously under or uncompared. Um, and the aim of the project is not to create universalising understandings of literature across the globe as the discipline of world literature often does, but to make a significant intervention in or reshape the field of world literature and propose methodologies, training models and case studies that multilingual locals and multiple significant geographies are appropriate for the study of world literature. There are nine of us on the project, including a project coordinator, and it's led by Francesca Orsini at SOAS, um, who also heads the North India case study on the project. So this centrality of comparison to our work um, throws up a number of problems when it comes to defining and working with our research data. This is the issue that I want to really kind of hone in on today and talk a bit more about. So there's a number of researchers that have um, identified this difficulty in delineating what constitutes humanities research data exactly, and I've popped a few quotations um, that I found from presentations made in an event in 2013 at the um, RDMF that kind of illustrate some of these um, difficulties and what these researchers saw in this in this field. Um, the act of comparison that undergirds our project particularly complicates this a bit further, I think. And in the past year or so, we have come across a number of problems in asserting what constitutes our research data and what we're meant to do with it, either as, as a team or even individually. Um, and as we might get from the kind of description I provided of the project, um, the data we're using are mainly examples of literary works, um, primarily from our three geographical and linguistic case studies, um, but the process of dividing which or deciding which works of literature should be included for these comparisons is quite a challenge for a number of reasons. Um, and primarily amongst these 
is the inevitable asymmetry of knowledge that comes with a group project like this. So we work on three distinct regions with at least six principal research languages, and this means we have a wonderful array of resources, as this slide, I hope, illustrates. We have translations of John Bunyan's um, Pilgrim's Progress into Urdu from the 1870s. We have a very modern Amharic literature from Ethiopia. We have Hindi historical fiction from the 1940s and Arabic children's stories from Egypt in the 1920s. You know, this is just some of the things we talked about in the last few months to try and kind of show you a picture of the languages and the genres that we're touching upon and the breadth of stuff that we're doing. Um, but it's these kind of symmetries in linguistic knowledge that kind of limit um, how we can engage with the other parts of the project, obviously. Um, so my own research focuses on, on Hindi and Urdu, for example, um, within North India, and I studied Arabic and French before, so I have some ability to engage with the North India, uh, sorry, North Africa case study, but when it comes to the uh, Horn of Africa case study with Oromo, Tigrinya and Amharic, I am woefully kind of unprepared or un unable to engage these things at this point in time. So there is a real issue of kind of, as hard as I might try at the moment, linguistically I can't obviously um, take these things on board. And so I've popped also here, there we go, just kind of main research language we work in, um, both European languages that obviously have different histories in these regions from the colonial period onwards and also the kind of um, local and national languages of the regions that we're looking at. So um, as you can see, it's quite a, quite a range of languages to work with a, with a group of eight researchers, basically. Um, and the same limits, I suppose, also apply to contextual knowledge. So while all members of the case study have a kind of general understanding of the histories and, and structures of, of cultures and the reasons we're talking about, there are obviously huge differences in our ability to engage in the in the contextual knowledge that underpins these things. So a prime example would be the colonial history of India, which is a 200 year process that ends in 47, um, compared to colonial history of Ethiopia, which was only occupied by a foreign power for five or six years in the 20th century, but had other kind of contacts and interactions with colonial powers, whether Italian or German or, or, or British throughout the 19th and 20th century. So these things don't correlate. And in the project, we're trying to bring together these languages and also these time periods and different kind of historical processes that are at play there. So we're looking not only at the pre-modern or pre-colonial um, work, which is something that Francesca has worked on in some length beforehand, but the colonial period as well and the post-colonial decolonialism period as well. So we have this kind of not only linguistic matrix, but a kind of temporal and other contextual matrix to work with as well within that. Um, I mean, this... I'm not saying this to kind of belittle the comparative focus of the of the research or the research in itself, and I think you know the, we have to acknowledge the practical limits of our knowledge and try and work through these together with collaboration. That's one of the main things that I really enjoy about working on this project. But on the very basic level of drawing up a suitable list of comparables that can constitute our research data, these limits have proved quite a big challenge to our to our project work. And this bind is kind of further tightened by the theoretical basis that forms, you know, the kind of context, the conceptual undergirding of the project. We're looking at ideas of world literature or comparative literature that um, have been theorised by different people in different ways, using different languages and contexts as well. So I'm particularly people like David Damrosh, who've worked on world literature as a concept for a long time, but use the Epic of Gilgamesh, for example, as their main kind of text to do that. We have no primary ability to engage with that with that data at all. So there is a kind of disparity or, or an asymmetry there that we have to deal with as well. And so to head off these challenges, we, on the project, have kind of developed our own protocols to say um, to try and create productive and relevant comparisons between the case study regions. So this has primarily been a case of spending time working together to elaborate comprehensive lists of what we're calling comparables. Um, so that is literary works that can form the basis of the comparisons between our case studies. These works are our primary research data to all intents and purposes. They are the things that we're going to be working from to develop our our methodologies and our ideas about what we're talking about. Um, and we've made a kind of effort not to only delineate them by language, but also by other um, other characteristics, so genre, audience, time period, script, materials, provenance, that kind of thing. Um, and so working within this schema allows us to navigate the linguistic barriers that I've talked a bit about just now, while at the same time retaining the um, particularities of each work and not assuming these particularities to a kind of generalised whole as often happens when comparisons are, are made and more recently we started 
an intense period of kind of working within our, our case study smaller groups, um, having spent much of the last year working holistically as a whole project together. Um, and we're using the time to debate areas um, of interest in our more particular geographic and linguistic regions, which we can then hopefully bring to the table when we meet as a project to discuss where we can compare these things. Um, and this flexibility of moving between the big and the small pictures helps us delineate data that functions on the various micro levels of the case studies of the project, but also on the macro level of the, the themes and ideas of um, the project more broadly. And so moving forward, we hope to use these um, kind of these small lists of comparables to divide our research data thematically and focus our comparative approach within parameters that don't reify language as the defining feature of the literatures we're working with. This is something that Karima Lashir, who's the head of the North Africa case study on the project, and Francesca Rossini as well, have made a kind of central feature of one of the methodologies they're developing called reading together, so bringing literatures together to um, read them across and between languages much more than within their linguistic uh, silos, if you like. Um, we've also used kind of m other more public means to try and make our research data more understandable to both those on the project and those in the kind of wider academic and reading publics. Um, we made a concerted effort in our event planning to try and make our content as accessible to one another as possible, and this is a part an issue of, of balance, so making sure that each of the regions receives equal billing in single events and across our events calendars um, more generally so as to keep each of the case studies in our minds irrespective of our own focuses and our own abilities in terms of the knowledge that we bring to the project. Um, so we had a project in the summer, uh, sorry, a workshop in the summer um, organised with the CNRS and Talim in Paris, which is, this is the very jazzy um, uh, flyer for that, where we brought together scholars working on each of our three key regions um, and further afield, and we placed them in panels that were not just defined by geography, but by other thematic conceptualizations. And this might sound quite basic and banal, but actually is something that is not often done at, with small and large events where we try and think about comparative thematics across um, different literatures or different, different concepts, for example. Um, and what this produced for us was a more well-rounded experience in which the patterns and comparisons that we're, that we're looking for in the project were more easy to, to identify. And this kind of also contrasted to an event we held in the first year of the project, um, a seminar, a workshop at at SOAS where we were doing, dealing with pre-modern literatures and trying to get people to talk together or with each other and also with the project and it it didn't really work I think because the way we'd set up the the call for papers and that kind of thing wasn't oriented towards that and it's something that we're trying to address in our submissions going forward to make sure these things are done at the events that we can hold and we've taken a very similar approach in building the website for our project, which we're using both as a means to publicise the project um, and as a constructive forum for debating issues pertinent to the project. So the website is structured around three key areas, readings, interventions and itineraries, which you can see on the board there, which we hope to populate with content that pertains both to the project regions and other geographic and linguistic locales. Um, I suppose the website extends the um, basis for our comparisons and the breadth of our research data. So by commissioning scholars from around the world to contribute content to the site, we're able to include sources from a number of languages and cultures that are outside our immediate remit. Um, we're also using the website as a repository for educational resources such as collaboratively compiled um, courses that can be downloaded and used by scholars and teachers around the world. So this is um, accessible on the website, which is here. Um, it's open access, you register on the site and then you can download and use them as you wish. And our, most, our first one went online last week and it brings together uh, Fatma Burney, who's a postdoc on the project, Francesco Orsini and Nick Harrison at KCL, talking about comparative colonial pedagogies between North Africa and North India to so try and kind of bring together um, different, different contexts in which colonial teaching was done, but looking at how that's threaded in the literature and, and setting this out in a kind of seven or eight week syllabus that can be used either in its entirety or in its, you know, just for its little readings every now and then. Um, and the work that we produce for the website also ticks that ever important kind of outreach and impact box, I suppose, um, which is aided by our Facebook and our Twitter, which I've put on here. So if you're on those platforms, please do follow or like us and you'll get to see me curating our Facebook content every day, which is a fun job for me. Um, <laughs> 
So while these efforts have helped us delineating kind of suitable comparables as our research data or are, are helping us do that, Molossogy should probably be doing a bit more to both define and develop our research data. So one element of our research data man management that we are currently lacking is a fully fledged strategy for ensuring that our data are suitably ordered and crucially reproducible in the future. This is something that has just been discussed a lot over the last two days. Um, and it's really important for our project, partly because we want to use these case studies and this data as a way to influence uh, methodologies and tools that people can use in the future to do similar things, even if they're not in the language groupings that we're talking about. Um, I think this goes back to what Gethin was saying yesterday about linking together data, tools and resources and so making sure the whole, the whole package is there to ensure that they all work together holistically, I think. Um, and so for this, that we need something along the lines of a research bibliography, which is, I mean, basically just a better method of collating and recording the data that we're using day to day, whether that's reading it once and putting it aside and saying it's not worth it for the project or using it for our main analysis in, in my PhD, for example. So we talked, I talked to Nathan a few weeks ago about this and I brought it to the attention of the project and I hope that it's going to be something we can build on going forward. But as I say, this is something that we hadn't really thought about until now um, for whatever reason. And I joined the project last year, so this is something that we're playing catch up on a little bit. We're two and a half years in now and we need to kind of really make sure this data is accessible and reproducible going forward for obvious legal reasons as well. Um, there are challenges to this, of course, um, and that's primarily because of the nature and typology of the sources that we're going to be using. So one is the variance in the kind of material structure of the sources and the data that we're relying on. So there are a number of us in the project that rely on the kind of modern format of the handy and durable book, but there are others that work on manuscripts or other kind of less hardy um, materials that are less accessible from somewhere like the UK or from the US. Um, so ensuring that these are all properly indexed to standard criteria is a priority for us, particularly because a number of us are going on fieldwork either this year or next year, it's something we need to kind of really crack the whip on and make sure we have a way of standardising these things. Um, and connected to this is a question of dissemination. So as work by Christine L. Borgman has shown, there's something of a conundrum in the sharing of research data mm -hmm. beyond an individual or project group, not least because of the constraints posed by copyright law um, in the case of more recent publications. And this varies on our project. Some of the work is going to be 19th century or before. Some of it is going to be, as you saw, 2016. Um, there are disparities there. There are different realms of copyright that we need to work with both in the UK within Europe and the other geographies that we're looking at so we need to find a way to provide adequate bibliographic and reference information to these resources that are subject to copyright constraints while also making as much of an effort as we can to make these as, as accessible as possible to people who want to reuse these things in the future um, and there's another kind of more technical issue there of course in terms of making sure this data is um, accessible in a in a physical sense in terms of reading and transliterating these things. Transliteration systems between even Arabic and Hindi and Urdu use similar characters to mean very different things. So we have to find a way in which we as a project, first of all, and then those who might want to use the data after us, are able to access this data irrespective of their ability to read these languages either in their primary form or in a transliterated form. And I mean this is also with Amharic have a very complicated system of transliteration. Um, which is not accessible to somebody who doesn't know Amharic or Amharic, for example. So um, this kind of focus on making sure the metadata is there and accessible is something that I'm trying to really push with the project more, um, more broadly going forward. So to conclude, considerations about research data from Lossogy are, as I hope to have shown today, couched in the project's search for patterns and comparisons between our three geographical and linguistic case studies. It's this comparative focus that makes the process of defining and working with research data a significant challenge. So asymmetries of knowledge shape how we as individuals and as a team are able to approach sources and necessitate extra efforts to ensure data are comprehensible to all on the project. Um, constructing lists of comparables and making use of public events and digital spaces allow us to mitigate some of these effects. Um, and I think kind of extend the epistemic frameworks within which the project can operate ultimately. So moving forward, I hope we can build something 
that resembles a research bibliography and makes sure that it's useful for people to come who want to emulate the methods that we're going to be using at least in the future. Thank you for your attention. I look forward to your comments. I mean, of course there are, but what I'm trying to say with this is that it's not the same thing as doing a philological or archaeological work on yeah, something that, that is yeah. tangible that you can codify and look at in a certain way. What I'm trying to say with this, and I appreciate why you don't want to have necessarily have methodological concerns here, but what, I'm, what I've tried to do with this presentation is say that actually, at the moment, the conceptual underpinnings of this project mean that determining how we... I mean, we talked a lot about kind of data is existing and data is generated the last few days, yeah, right? Yeah, so that's, so that's the question you're getting at. Fine, of course, and, and th there is a difference there. At the moment, we're still at a point in the project where we know what we think we want to achieve with this data, but actually it's not a case of saying, oh, of course, all these novels in Amharic, Hindi and Arabic are going to do the same thing, hence why we have to take a step back from that and actually assess how we come up with these primary sources or primary data in their initial thing. Because, as you say, I could go around any bookshop in London and find any, a number of books. There's also an issue of, of, um, of access there, you know, just because a book is here doesn't mean that it actually represents anything about literary culture that we're talking about. So we're not at a stage to say that, like, yeah, and I don't actually know. This is why I included those quotes of other researchers saying this, because I think there is a difference, even within this humanities and social sciences umbrella, there are very different methods that we use, very different methods. And I think a lot of the presentations the last few days are focused on, as I say, philological, archaeological things that are not more tangible per se, but have a, have a particular methodology inherent to them. I, I think that there is some of that in literary criticism or literary studies more broadly, but I think actually there is a difference in how we can engage with that data and then generate our own data from it. That's what I've tried to bring to the fore here. I don't know what form that generated data would be for us, frankly, because I don't know when I work on a text, there are certain kind of characteristics of it that I'll look for, certain facets of the text or functions of the text that I'll use to draw an argument together. Um, those aren't always inherent to the text. These are normally influenced by secondary material, or not normally, sometimes can be by secondary material. So finding a way to do that is really important for us because we have a hell of a lot of material and scope here. Yeah. <coughs> Which is, so to try and paraphrase it, that it's, if you're doing a text critical edition or you're doing archaeology, there are certain moments where there's, kind of, there's quite naturally there's, there's data that your method creates mm. uh, that's easy to file somewhere. It's not as obvious that there are specific moments in, in, in the methodology that naturally produce a kind of a, exactly exactly a data sets, uh, but that one thing that you have observed is that the one thing that makes doing literary criticism different than reading is the engagement with uh, the secondary literature in literary criticism. Absolutely, and, and and that's what you're thinking about how to mo model or keep track of more. Absolutely, readers. and that's not, that's not to to say that that doesn't happen in the other fields we talked about, but I think there's a, there's a particular type of interaction between 
secondary and primary in literary studies as opposed to the fields we talked about, you know, I think, I think and these obviously do interact, but as you say, I think there is a particular kind of relationship you need to take into account when you're talking about managing or generating your own data. Just a quick thought. Uh, <coughs> the, the fields that we've often been hearing for find themselves in a position of having to create the digital object that will act as the point that links together the image, the reading of the inscription, etc. But it occurs to me with modern literature, of course, you have, because they're generated in the modern world, they come with that data already attached, mm. ISBNs and other uh, things. Um, you know, review platforms, right? Because review is part of the. the to, to what extent do you feed into those, right? To what extent do you tag your data using. Based on those, yeah. Uh, yeah. ISBNs and things like that yeah. to link it to the object, because the object has a kind of metadata digital identifier yeah. already. Uh, I think in terms of reproducing the data, it's exceptionally useful to, to to use those and to make use of them, I think, absolutely. So you know, there's a reason why ISBNs are useful for us finding books, because they can help you find something you wouldn't find others. But I think it, you know, just, it, I don't think we can rely solely on those, because those are geared towards a particular way of consuming that material, a commercial or whatever, a personal form. We have to kind of add to that metadata that perhaps deals with thematics or question just script or language that can also kind of supplement these more practical access data, I suppose. Somebody did want to ask a question. I have a question. Um, I know that in some of the areas you work on, uh, literature is um, very multimodal because it's also performed, and yep. that's an aspect that you haven't touched on yep. at all. So presumably, you would also have audiovisual data um, that need to find your, your image and scan data, etc. Yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that? So I think the emphasis of the project is primarily on the on written literature, but I think to to your point, these are these don't exist in a vacuum, obviously, and so we do have to take into consideration that orature is an exceptionally important thing, performance, as you said, is an exceptionally important thing. So I think in terms of the data that we're going to be collecting or generating ourselves, those things won't necessarily be part of the, I mean, I, in fact, in fact, they will. I think, you know, I think book history is, is one thing, you know, the, the, the presentation of these books is very important. So I think you're very right to bring that up. But in terms of um, trying to navigate this orature literature binarization, that's not always helpful. I, I, I don't quite know how we would do that, particularly with the more modern stuff where there are performances available to them. I think this is something that I can take back to the team because actually it's, if we do have performances of a Hindi play that we can find being performed, then all the better, do you know what I mean? I think and there's a, a other layers that we can add to that. So thank you for that. <laughs>